today. I, I'm hoping that we have some new viewers uh, because the subject matter is going to be pretty, pretty good. Um, it's going to be about the Tower of Babel and world government. Uh, you probably will learn some new stuff here today. If, if you don't, then uh, you are well informed, and that's great. I want to uh, start off by telling you that my intention for teaching on this today is not to make people afraid, but just simply help you understand what's happening in your world right now and why God is in control of that, and it's okay, yeah, especially when you're believers. Now, if you're not a believer, you've got all kinds of problems, but as a believer, as a believer, I'm kidding. As a believer, uh, you should not be afraid. Um, couple things I want to say before we get into this, just to get it uh, out of the way. For those of you that are part of uh, this church family, uh, we lost Jim Meadows on Friday, and we're going to be looking into trying to do some kind of memorial service for him uh, in the week that's coming up. There's just a lot I have to do yet uh, to prepare for that. Uh, so be patient with me on that, and we'll get to that. Hopefully next Sunday uh, we'll be able to actually meet together as a church again. Uh, there seems to be some uh, uh, hope there on the horizon that we can, uh, which will be a wonderful day for me. I, I, I hope it is for some of you, um, or all of you actually. But uh, before we start today, I want to pray, and then I'm going to give you some information to help you understand the flow of this. And when we're done, I'm, I'm hoping you do have a greater understanding of what it is that happened during the Tower of Babel, and what is happening now in your world and the governments of your world. So let's pray before we start. Um, yeah, let's do that. Lord, we do pray that today you would be glorified and that what is taught here today is according to your will and what you want us to know. Lord, I pray that... Uh, you would take control of this and that you would lead me through it very, very clearly and concisely. Um, uh, I do pray that uh, as time moves on for us as people, that we would be more effective at sharing uh, the gospel message to people. Lord, I pray that those that don't know you would know you. I know that your goal is to save. I know your goal is to heal. I know that you're intention is always for good, even when things uh, don't seem that way. You're always moving us in a direction of a greater knowledge of you, and you're always moving us in the direction for developed relationship with you. So I pray that today um, that would happen, that there would be a deeper knowledge and a greater intimacy between the people that are going to be watching and and you and us as a family. So uh, I do pray that you would be glorified. And as always, thank you for your son. Thank you for forgiveness that's been offered. Thank you that you do love us. And we ask this according to your will. Amen. Okay, let me give you some information to get us started because, again, some of you, and you have to understand this, uh, some of you are going to feel a sense of shock or disbelief. I understand that. Um, usually when you see something new, it, it, it's very difficult for it to set in for you to recognize it. I remember uh, when the coronavirus issue started, and at first I didn't, it didn't register in my mind that this was going to get this way, and then somebody very graciously let me know, yes, it is, and it clicked finally. I was like, okay, this is going to be something that's going to alter and disrupt our lives. Uh, we tend to resist things that are different to us. Um, those of us that are older who have lived during the uh, very unique time in history when we were still um, kind of like what it was in the 50s as we slowly moved from the 50s on through, things were unique. I remember growing up when uh, everything was closed on Sunday, and you stayed home, and you actually went to church and ate with your family. I remember having to dress up to fly on airplanes or to even go shopping at times. We would dress if we were going out into town. So, And those of you that are my age probably remember Dippity-Doo, which was this stuff you put in your hair, and it made it stiff. 
And we had that a lot as kids. But the difficulty you're up against right now in your society is things have changed, and they are permanently going to be changed. Now, there's a lot of people I've talked to throughout the week who are like, no, it's not, no, it's not, no, we're not, no, it hasn't. They just they resist the idea that there has been a change that has occurred. Um, I understand that. We don't like change uh, in some cases. Uh, I have found, again, that the older you get, the more you resist accepting change. Uh, it's the reason why older people tend to not learn to use their phones. They tend to not learn how to do a computer. They don't, they don't like the change. They actually complain about it a lot. I've had people tell me that it's almost sinful and they really think this way, that if you're using a tablet with the Bible on it, that somehow that's wrong because it's not a paperback Bible. Um, all of that stuff happens in our heads. So my goal today is to show you what is actually happening. It's from a biblical perspective. Uh, it's very real, and I will demonstrate that to you later on in the sermon. I'm going to show you very clear, concise evidence of the direction your world is going in, and it's going to be by people who are actually the ones doing it. So, again, this is not to make you afraid, and I hope I get everything in I need to get into this to help you have a better understanding so you can actually transition into it effectively and, and, and understand. Because a lack of understanding tends to produce fear in people. When you don't know what's going on, uh, it makes you afraid. When you have the knowledge you need to understand the movement, it tends to ease the pressure and the strain and gives you the ability to function and think more clearly. So we want to, uh, before I start, I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some information. We're going to be mainly in Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 9. Those are the main verses we're going to be dealing with. But I have to build this premise for you so you can understand and follow along. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 10. And after we look at 10, we're going to move into chapter 11. Uh, the names that are mentioned in chapter 10, archaeology has actually found documentation of most of those names you see in chapter 10 of, uh, in chapter 10 of uh, Genesis, meaning we have historical records showing that the people in chapter 10 did really exist. You also have, and those of you that are familiar with the Tower of Babel, uh, one, and we'll look at it, one of the things is, is at the time of Tower of Babel, they were all speaking one language. Well, the Sumerians actually have written documents stating that during the time period of the Tower of Babel, they all spoke one language. So you have extra-biblical documentation that they actually did speak one language. So just from the get-go, you can go look this up. There is historical evidence biblically, and there is extra-biblical historical evidence that what is being said in chapter 10 and in chapter 11 really did happen, okay? So... I've just removed any doubt from those of you that think it's just some story somebody made up. No, it's not. It really happened. And amazingly enough, the, the ideas that were occurring at that time have occurred at different points in history, and it is occurring now. So that's, uh, you're sitting there going, what's he talking about? We're gonna, I'm going to show you. I just wanted to give you a preliminary, uh, you know, understanding that this is real, okay? Okay. Um, what we're going to be looking at is the Tower of Babel and a particular individual named Nimrod and what his goals were. Uh, his, his goals were to attempt to unify the world as one group of people. That was his goal. Uh, he desired a global community, and uh, that's happening now. Um, it's happening faster and more effectively than you probably have thought about um, one, one of the views here is, and this is what needs to be understood, um, God has a plan for man in the way he wants things to progress. Man, though, also has his own plan for the way he wants things to progress. And that's what's happening. There's this battle almost uh, could be said 
of two kingdoms. Uh, there's the world trying to do things its way, and then there's God who is going to bring the world to a point where it does it his way. And that's the conflict that you'll see. What it says, and I want to show you, if you go to Ephesians 6.12, it tells you this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So first and foremost, you need to know, according to your scripture, there is a battle occurring. This is just one verse I gave you, one piece of scripture. But the battle isn't between people, really. It is between God and what is evil. It is, again, it, it, it's... It's this movement that I mentioned in one sermon recently, what happens under the surface of the water that you don't see. We tend to look at things around us and think that's it. No, there is a battle occurring right now that's on a spiritual level. And I'm saying that also because you need to understand that what is happening in your, on your planet is a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's not me against them. It's not you against me. That, that's the byproduct of what's actually happening. It is not what is actually happening. It is just the byproduct. So we're going to see this, I think, today. And you may even have to watch this sermon more than once. Because for it to set in, um, you're going to have to really take the time to think about it. So I hope you have your coffee, you're settled in, you're, you're ready to go to work, because there's a lot here. Um, so God has a plan for man. Mankind has its own idea. There is the goal to unify the world as one. And I'm going to show you that later on. I told you I would. I'm going to show you that, that it really is happening. Um, I wanted to give you a quote from a book that is read by a lot of political leaders. It's read by a lot of people even in the education system. And the name of the book is Rules for Radicals. And in this book, there's a statement made by the writer that I find very interesting. He said, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom was Lucifer, Satan. He's got a great point. There has been, throughout the history of mankind, this radical resistance to the things of God and what God says. You're seeing that happen on your planet right now. There is a full-blown resistance to Christ. The word antichrist doesn't just mean an individual like everybody thinks of. It literally means against the things of Christ, against Christ. There is what would be called an attitude or a spirit in this world, an attitude in this world of antichrist thinking. We want God out of everything. We want to set our own rules and standards. We don't care what God has said is right or wrong. We are going to redefine right and wrong. We are even going to refine, redefine genders. Everything we're doing is anti-Christ. It is not pro-Christ on this planet. You need to know that. That is the planet you live on now as a believer. That's why I say all the time, you either become a kingdom-minded person, thinking like a Christian, obeying what our king tells us to do to the best of your ability, or you are in the world, and the world is against Christ. And you can straddle that fence even and think, well, I'll be a little bit in the world and I'll be a little bit in Christ's kingdom. That doesn't work. You're either following the, the teachings of Christ and his authority and leadership, or you're going to be following the world and their resistance to the word of God and to Christ. So you need to understand this, and some of you aren't going to like that I say this. You were either pro-Christ in your thinking or you were anti-Christ in your thinking. And playing little word games with his name doesn't make you pro-Christ. It's just you playing word games. Okay, so that's that's a hard one for people to wrap their head around, but we need to. We need to decide which side of the fence we're going to stand on. Who are we going to be? Are we going to be Christians? Or are we going to be of the world? And Nimrod, you're going to see, was a classic example of what the world is doing and how it's been operating. 
So enough of that. Uh, you're probably asleep now. I'm sorry if you are. But once we get into it, you're going to love this. So go to Genesis 10, verses 8 through 9. Cush fathered Nimrod. Now, Nimrod was the great-grandson of Noah. You need to understand that. Which means that Nimrod had full knowledge of the flood and the total demise of the world during the time of Noah. He understood that the, God's judgment had fallen on the planet. It wasn't just like fantasy to him. I think it was only like 134 years later, something like that. And I hate numbers because I always get them wrong. But he knew. So it's not something he didn't know. Just a little side note for you. In the book of Revelation, when it talks about the end of the world, the end times, they know that they're fighting God also. If you read your scriptures, you'll see that. So at the end of everything, according to the scriptures, the world is going to know that it is resisting God. Just like Nimrod knew at this point in time that he was resisting God. Don't miss that. You can go do your own study and see that I'm telling you the truth on this. So Nimrod, he was the first on earth to be mighty, a mighty man, meaning he had power. He's the first person who had risen to a level of power that was intense. He was a mighty hunter. Now you look at that and you think this is talking about hunting. It's not. In the Hebrew, this is entirely different. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Before the Lord means, in essence, that he was doing something enough that it got God's attention. Now, don't think God wasn't aware of any of it. He was. It's just the writers making the point that this is an intense moment. Here's this mighty man, first one on earth after the flood. And the reason why Hunter's in there is he is not a hunter like hunting animals. He is a hunter of souls. He is a hunter of men is what this is referring to. His intention is a tyrannical intention. His goal is to control men. Um, let me give you an example of this. Uh, Satan is a hunter of men. What Satan does is his desire is to take hold of human beings and use them for his own gain. That's his goal. His goal is to destroy anything God is doing and to demonstrate as much hatred towards God as he possibly can. So he uses human beings to do that. He is a hunter of men. Nimrod is a hunter of men. And that's why that's important to catch. It says, therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. He is out to pursue. Now, keep this in mind. Tyrannical thinking people are hunters of men. People who want to get control of people, right? They're tyrannical in their nature. And there's a methodology they use to get control of men, and we're going to see that in the Tower of Babel. Here's the neat thing you need to remember. Jesus is also after the souls of people, except he's not a hunter of men. He's a shepherd, and there's a difference. A shepherd is sacrificial towards those that he shepherds. It's to their benefit that he seeks them and serves them. To a person that is a hunter of men, it is to the benefit of the individual doing the hunting. Please do not miss that. Because you'll find in every tyrannical society, the benefits always go to the hunter, not the people. You will find in every, and this is not a political sermon, so don't, I just give you, I'm just giving you this so you know. In every communist socialist structure on the planet, even in the type of structure we have as a government, those that benefit from mankind are those who are in power. It's, it's always been that way. We're the plebes. We're the peasants. They use us for personal gain. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus' kingdom is he is the servant, the suffering servant, who serves us for the purpose of blessing us, and in the process, we serve him back out of a relationship, not out of a tyrannical form of control. You need to understand that. You live on a planet where mankind will offer you blessing, will offer you something of value, 
get you to where you see that as having value, but they use it against you because their goal is not the same as our Lord Christ. Our Lord Christ is to bless us and make us a part of his family. The world's intention is self-serving and selfish. Do not miss that as you watch what's going on. As you vote, you need to know none of these people out there that you're voting for have the heart of Christ. They are not doing this totally for you. Some do better than others. Just keep it in mind, you are kingdom people if you're Christians. You belong to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, not the kingdom of the world. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. We have to learn that and obey that and live by that. This is not your home. This is not your home. You are journeying through, okay? That was a little more than the servant. <laughs> All right, so now Nimrod, we see who this guy is. He's a mighty hunter. He's a tyrant. Um, he's doing what Satan basically does. Now we want to go to Genesis 11, <clears throat> 1 through 9, and I'm going to break some things down for you. And, and it's gonna, you're going to sit there and go, wow. Because <laughs> when I first learned it, I was like, wow. <laughs> so look at this. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Now I showed you that archaeology has shown that there are other cultures that say the same thing. Now... I want you to catch all the next statements here. And as the, okay, so they got one world language. As the people migrated from the east. Now, everybody automatically thinks, okay, they're moving east. No, you have to understand Hebrew language. What it's, um, you know how people say a guy doesn't know his right hand from his left? Okay, so that's defining that that individual doesn't, uh, know his right uh, a, a point of location, right hand from the left, another point of location. In the Hebrew writing, they do the same thing. So from the east is to say that they are moving away from God, okay? Um, it all means something, especially that. They have left the location of where the ark had landed. They're moving away from the east, meaning away from God. So that's not just that they're moving in the direction from the east. It's saying the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as a people migrated from God, they found a plain in the land of Sanar and settled there. Next. And they said to one another, don't miss that. Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Okay? Now stop. I want to read something to you. Notice that, and there's a lot we're going to cover right here. Notice that they keep saying, come, let us. And they're saying, let us build. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us do this. Let me read this to you. The statement here is called the decade of action. And then the next word there is will, dot, 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 dot. Mobilize everyone everywhere. Note what they keep saying. We will work to create an unstoppable force linked to global goals. We will identify risk to ensure no one is left behind. This requires each of us to take action, individually, collectively, locally, and globally. Demand urgency and ambition. We must be the generation to end extreme poverty, win the race against climate change, and conquer injustice and gender inequality. We will hold leaders to account and point to what is possible when action delivers results, supercharged ideas to solutions. We will shine a light on solutions that expand access and demonstrate the possibilities of ideas. We will drive sustainable innovation, financial investments, and technology while making space in our communities and cities for young people to lead. That is your UN 
making that statement. We're going to look at a video a little later so you can see it for yourself. That there is a movement right now that is absolutely like this movement. We will do this. We are going to go away from God socially in our societies. We will move from the east away from God and we will build bricks. We will build a tower. So don't miss it. Let me give you some more here. Come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. If you study Hebrew text, you will understand that there's a difference between bricks and stone. God told Israel when they built uh, monuments, little altars, to build it out of stone. Reason being, if you understand the Hebrew mindset, stone is unique. Each one is individually unique. That's why God identifies this, build these out of stones, not bricks. Now, they're going to build out of bricks. If you look at it, even in the Hebrew, some of the Hebrew texts, when it says that man is created in the image of God, one of the uh, main thought patterns in the early times of the Hebrew people was is that that meant unique, like a stone. So in the image of God, God is unique. God created us to be unique. That's in the early Hebrew writings. Nimrod comes along and he says, let us make bricks. Bricks are all the same size, shape. They are uniformed. They all can be adjusted and set in multiple ways to fit. They're identical. So he's saying, let us make bricks. Let's, in essence, and again, this is where you have to do some history study. Bricks and stone have in the Hebrew language are representative of people. Okay? So he's saying, and they said to one another, come, let us make everybody the same, everybody globalize, and burn them thoroughly, meaning make sure that it's good and solid and strong. And they had brick for stone, meaning they replaced stone and used brick. And bitmen, which was a type of mortar, it was a type of um, tar, uh, they used it for mortar. Now, this product that they used, a bitmen, I believe, is the same thing they even used when they built the ark. But bitmen has the ability, when you use it to form a building up, it's real hard to break it apart once you've built with bitmen. Now, the word mortar in the Hebrew is an interesting word. The word mortar in the Hebrew can also mean material or materialism. Matter, substance, the word mortar there in the Hebrew literally means material, which is where we get our word materialism. So what's going to bind the bricks together, and again, please understand, I'm giving you only what I know, so don't, don't flip out about this. I'm going to explain some things. Just stay with me. It's almost as if the text is saying for us to bind the people together to build this world that we want to build, materialism is what we're going to use to cause the binding. So if you look at your society since especially the 1950s, we have been developing a materialistic mindset. You want me to give you an example of that? Go try and take your phone away from your teenager and watch what happens. Look how the credit card has become like the most important thing in your wallet, and we just buy and buy and buy and buy. Our commercials are structured in such a way to make you materialistic in your thinking. They're not going on there going, hey, you don't want this car. You could drive a cheaper car. You don't need this car. No, they're going, you want this car. So you're living on a planet right now that is extremely materialistic in its thinking, and it actually has caused a binding effect globally. Everything we talk about predominantly is economics, and we're even discussing the economic disruption that has occurred because of coronavirus. So you need to understand, your Bible talks in reference to this stuff. Now, I don't know that it's materialism necessarily that's binding everything together. There may be something else that comes up that gets everybody to want to bind together as a globalized world. It could be the coronavirus. It could be the environment. It could be any of those things. But somewhere in here, in our time period, somewhere in here, there's going to be 
a unifying of the people on this globe, and we're all going to become like one bunch of bricks. Individualism will go away. Now, that's what your Bible tells you even in the, Old, in the New Testament when you get into the book of Revelation and end times. So you need to understand we are moving in a direction, not a direction so much that the world is making happen. God said, this is what's coming next. He's told us what's next. Satan is going to establish a world kingdom. It says that, the tribulation period. The book of Daniel talks about it. It's coming. We uh, Hopefully, we're raptured out. Hopefully, we're not here for all of that. But it is coming. And Satan is resisting Christ, and he is using people to do that. And there's going to be a final time where the millennial king happens, where Jesus' earthly kingdom is formed, and then all of everything is done, and finally there's eternity, and we live with Christ in eternity under his rulership. Okay? I hope you're not flipping out. I just hope you see what's happening here. So they kept saying, Come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They're resisting what God institutes, and you'll see it later here, which is nationalistic thinking, which is interesting. They're saying, let's not be nationalistic. Let's be a globalized community. God comes along, and he says, no, you're going to scatter, and you're going to be nationalistic. You're going to be individual nations with something to contribute as individual nations. Nimrod is saying, no, we want to be one nation. We will not scatter. Okay? So it says in verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, please do not miss this. Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Note this, and nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Now, let me help you see this a little bit. Again, don't etch this in stone. It's just an observation. They had a one-world language, and God says that if we do not stop them, which was an act of mercy, by the way, not judgment like some people try to say, if we do not stop them, anything they purpose to do will be now possible for them. They can do whatever they think of and do it, okay? Your Bible says this. So he scatters them. Now you have a statement made, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it. Later on, Jesus says, the last days will be as in the days of Noah, okay? That's around this time period. Just a thought for you. Isn't it interesting that the world now has a universal language, which is binary, which is the computer, you can communicate to anybody anywhere on the planet using binary language now. We have a globalized language. And ever since we got that globalized language, technology has skyrocketed. We are figuring things out right and left so fast it's unreal. And the sky's the limit. We've even, we're breaking the genetic code. Go look at the work on it. They literally have the ability to alter your genetic code now with a, a system called CRISPR. I'm not giving you anything that isn't public knowledge. It's public knowledge. We are moving in the direction of having a unified government, a unified people. I want to I give you some more of this to help you see it. So I want Alan to show you this video now that will show you. I read what is being said by the UN secretary. You can go to the UN website. They are not hiding anything. They are telling you this. And that little article I read you came from the UN website. So, so watch this video and read the caption. I have never seen so many people so animated around the sustainable development goals as during the past three days. From the SDG action zone on our lawn to billboards in Times Square, the SDGs are everywhere as they should be. We started this journey together in 2015 and we know our destination. Opportunity for all on an healthy planet. In short, we have set our sights on a fair globalization. The good news is that the 2030 agenda is coming to life and we are making progress. But let us be clear, 
we are far from where we need to be. We are off track. That is why today, as requested by our political declaration, I'm issuing a global call for a decade of action to deliver the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Tout d'abord, l'action à l'échelle mondiale. Le temps est venu de, de prendre des décisions audacieuses, tant sur le plan individuel que collectif. Il nous faut davantage de ressources. En deuxième lieu, l'action locale. Nous devons faire davantage au niveau national afin d'obtenir des résultats là où cela importe le plus, dans la vie des gens. Troisièmement, l'action individuelle. J'appelle la société civile, les associations locales, les médias, le secteur privé, les syndicats et les universités, entre autres, à plus que jamais travailler, mais main dans la main, vers des objectifs communs. We have the best solution in the Agenda 2030, our blueprint for a fair globalization. We must step up our efforts, and we must do it now. All right. We took that directly from the UN website. Hence, the Sustainable Development Goals, our shared vision to end poverty, rescue the planet, and build a peaceful world, are gaining global momentum. With just 10 years to go, an ambitious global effort is underway to deliver the 2030 promise by mobilizing more governments, civil society, businesses, and calling on all people to make the global goals their own. Decade of action to deliver the global goals. Today's progress is being made in many places, but overall action to meet the goals is not yet advancing at the speed or scale required. 2020 needs to usher in a decade of ambitious action to deliver the goals by 2030. The decade of action calls for accelerating sustainable solutions to all the world's biggest challenges and ranging from poverty and gender to climate change, inequality, and close the financial gap. And close the financial gap. Okay? Everything I just gave you is on the UN website. They're not hiding it. They do not see it as something that needs to be hidden. That is important to understand. Because in your heads right now, if you're a logical thinking person, you're saying, wait a minute. What's wrong with this? There's no this sounds great. The answer is there's nothing wrong with it, except for one thing. God's not in it. God's not in it. And the other problem you have is... Again, you need to catch this and try and stay with me. God has designed things to be unique according to the way he wants it to be. He is actually going to accomplish the very goals that they're trying to accomplish in the millennial kingdom. It's going to be global. It's going to be everybody's taking care of. Everything's going to be okay. But you need to understand something. Satan throughout all of history has never come up with an original idea necessarily. He has always mimicked God's processes. His goal is to do what God is going to do just under a tyrannical system versus a shepherding system. So what you see here, you're going, wait a minute, this is good stuff. Absolutely it is. There's only one problem, God's not in it. And it will not function to your advantage. It will be a tyrannical system not a shepherding system. That is why I keep telling Christians, you need to understand that you need to be kingdom-minded people. You need to understand who your Lord is. Who do you follow? Who do you believe? What is your life going to be like in reference to what your Lord Jesus Christ said? It's either going to be what He has said, or you're going to follow the world system. And believe me, the world system looks like it's a good idea. And they will accomplish it, according to the book of Daniel, for three and a half years during the tribulation period. There will be a point in time when everything they talked about is going to happen under a tyranny, under the Antichrist. You need to understand that. Now, I'm not saying that in 10 years 
the Antichrist is coming. I'm not saying that at all. But you need to understand that the next 10 years of your life, the UN, the globalized concept, is going to be pushed as hard and heavy as they can possibly push it. They just said it. When I read you the first article where they said, we will, we will. They're not kidding. If you re watched and read the titles, they even said through media, they're going to push to get the globalized concept of the UN in the world fully and completely by 2030. They have a 17-step goal. And you need to go to the website and look at it. Again, it's not conspiracy theory. This is stuff you can go look at right on their website. So you know now as believers, we are moving in a direction that within the next 10 years, you need to expect to see a lot of things happen in reference to their 17 goals. They will happen. Now, God can throw a monkey wrench in and disrupt it. I want you to understand something. This is not political, what I'm saying. I don't know everything. I, don't, I can give you only what I observe, and it could be wrong. But I want you to understand this. If you go watch Donald Trump's first UN speech, it was all about nationalistic thinking. The secretary from the UN said that we got a glitch, basically. Bill Gates, who's getting blamed for all kinds of stuff, which is stupid, that's all conspiracy theory, but Bill Gates, you can go watch it, made the statement, he works heavily on fighting viruses on the planet, especially malaria. He said nationalism is part of the reason why coronavirus spread like it did. Go look at it. Because... There are lots of people that are pushing for globalism because it does make sense to globalize. It really does. And it's not an evil thing to globalize. The problem is, is God is the one who's in charge. And you see this all the way at the Tower of Babel. As one people in one language, will be in, nothing will be impossible for them now. And God intervenes and busts them up. And believe it or not, it was nationalism that occurred there. Now... Don't over-politicize that. Please don't be foolish and try and go into all this political jargon stuff. I'm just giving you what's there, okay? Knowing good and well that God is going to fulfill every single thing he ever said in your scriptures. He's going to do it, whether you like it or not. He will do it. Can God delay globalization? Can God delay the Antichrist. Yeah, he's the only one that knows the day or the time. Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He's the only one that knows it. But you need to understand, your world is never going to be what it once was. There is a major movement going on right now, globally, to change the world into a globalized society. Just accept it. It shouldn't make you afraid, especially as a believer. It should, this fear, fear is not from God. You are told repeatedly that you are secure, that you are sealed in, with the Holy Spirit, that you are one of his children, that he will not allow you to be snatched out of his hands. It doesn't matter what the world does. If you're a believer, they will not get you away from God. Your eternity is going to be with him under his lordship and leadership. They will not win and succeed at this. You have already won. You've already won. It's just a matter of things falling into place, just like God said they would. And the reason why it all has to happen is God is trying to save as many people as he can from the world and bring them into his kingdom. That's why the calling for all believers is to be witnesses to the world for the purpose of bringing them into the kingdom of Christ. All of that's in play right now. Here's your battle between principalities. Here's what's going on. You can look around and think some president's going to save you. You're wrong. There is no president that will save you. Republican, Democrat, anybody, you look king, queen, there's nobody that's going to save you and do what God's going to do. None. One's a shepherd. The others are tyrannical. Their motives are self-serving. They give you some things that you want because they've developed you to be materialistic thinkers, so they throw you some candy once in a while, so you'll think that they're doing you good, but the truth of the matter is it's always for them. Now, I'm not saying anything that cannot be proven throughout the history of the world. 
I'll give you a simple one. Stalin would have his school children sit in classes, and the teachers were told, say to the kids, let's pray now to God for candy. You all want candy? Let's pray to God for candy. So the kids would put their heads down on the desk, and they would pray to God that he would give them candy. And then the teacher would say, oh, well, guess you didn't get any candy, did you? Now let's pray to Stalin. Put your head down on your desk and let's ask Stalin to give us candy. And then the teacher would drop it from the air down on the desk. So it was like it was coming from heaven as a blessing. And these kids were getting candy and they were believing as young kids that it was because of Stalin. Your government wants you to think and the governments on the world want you to think that they are the ones who have control of everything, that they are the ones that are going to fix your health issues and your financial issues and all of the issues that are on this planet. They're going to fix it. No. It is God in God's time. It is God who sustains us. It is God who keeps us. They're not going to do anything but throw little con artist things at us to make us think that somehow they've made things better for us. It, don't buy the lie. That's Satan. That's so satanic, it's unreal. The problem is, it says in your scriptures, and we all miss this stuff, it says Satan will parade around as an angel of light, meaning he's going to make you think that what he is doing is good. That's what he does. But if it is not what God has said in God's method and God's approach, it's satanic. It's Satan. It is not God. I don't care how good it looks. I don't care how noble it is. If it is not from God, it is from Satan, and it is a con, okay? That's a lot. I just gave you a big sermon there. Okay, let me give you the rest, and we'll, we'll wrap up because I've said enough. Um, Come let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there <coughs> over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. They stopped. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all, or the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. I want to give you one little homework thing for you to go do on your own, and I'm done. Babel is the same word for Babylon. General location, everything. When you read in Revelation chapter 18, it speaks of the great Babylon. Everybody tries to say it's the Catholic Church, or it's the United States, or it's this or that. It's not. It's the spirit of. It's the mindset of. He's talking about Babylon, meaning this concept is in play. And, and stop trying to put it on some organization. That's stupid. It, it, doesn't, it does not hold up. Everything has to be universal. What God says is universally true. That's why I have a problem with prosperity teaching. If God wants us all to be prosperous, then it should be a universal truth. Well, sorry, the planet doesn't prove that. And I want to say this to you in a final thought. Prosperity teaching is from the pit of hell. It is materialistic thinking. And the idea behind it is to convince you that God wants you to be materialistically wealthy. Guess who's going to buy into the globalization movement who call themselves Christians? Just think about it, because it is the exact opposite of what Scripture tells you. Scripture tells you the poor will be with you always. I heard a pastor just recently who's in the prosperity movement say that the story of the prodigal son is really about God putting rings on his finger. And this guy went off making that whole message that God gives us on the prodigal son about wealth. Now that is demonic, period. Because anybody who knows, that text is about specific things, and it has nothing to do with wealth. But if you're a materialist, you'll make it about wealth. That's why I warn people, you be very careful who you listen to as your Bible teachers. 
Because there are people out there that are going to be a part of this new globalized movement, and they are going to portray themselves as being messengers of Christ, but they will not be. You check what they say against Scripture, all of Scripture, not just the little tidbits they pull out and piece together and try and force into a puzzle that's not there. Don't miss that. Please listen to that. Please understand this is not a political message. I'm a Christian. I'm just telling you what's happening in your world. I don't belong to a political party. I belong to the church of Jesus. That's my political party. That's who I follow. Those rules, those thoughts, everything he says and does, that's what I vote for. That's what I believe in. I don't go with what the world throws out. I don't care how well you twist and turn it to try and make it fit into Jesus' kingdom. But if Jesus says something's wrong, it's wrong. It's wrong. And you can have all the opinions you want to have. That makes you a part of the world. But a Christian follows to the best of their ability what Jesus says is right and what Jesus says is wrong. That's the truth for a Christian. Can't make it any more clear. Yes, I did get pretty intense. I hope you get the point. My goal here is to get you to understand I follow a shepherd. I follow someone who sacrifices for me. I follow someone who died so I wouldn't have to die. I'm going to keep following that same individual. I am encouraging you to take seriously your Lord, your King, the King of Kings of all of this, the King of Kings. Follow the King of Kings and stop dabbling in the world's methodology. It will not work. It's a lie. Now, probably made some mad. I don't know. Hopefully you're encouraged. I'm encouraged. I love it that I'm a Christian. I love it. And I love it that God has given me an instruction book to go by to live on this planet. I love it. I'm hoping that you move into the arena of being passionate about him also. I'm wore out now, so let's pray ourselves out. Um, Lord, I pray again, as always, that your words have been spoken. I pray that whatever it is you want to say to us, that it would etch itself on our hearts and that we would take it seriously and live by it. I pray that many people watch this video if it is your will. If it is not, then just cancel it out. I, I don't want to say or do anything that you would not have me do. If I have improperly identified anything about you and your plan, Lord, then please forgive that. And again, as always, remove it from the minds of people. But Lord, if what I said was absolutely in line and according to your will, Lord, I pray that you establish it on this earth as you do in heaven, that your will would be done. And again, thank you for all those people out there that I consider a church family. I do care about them. I do love them. And, and I pray that uh, you would keep them. And again, as always, thank you for our King Jesus and that blessing. Amen. You all have a good week. Thank you.